live. Hi, everyone, and welcome to PNP Live. I'm Jessica, one of the stories booksellers. Thank you for joining us in this new format where we continue to bring you the authors you love and their new books to the politics and prose community. At any time during the event, you can click on the green button below to purchase tonight's book on our website. Our physical stores are closed right now, and we need your online online purchases in order to keep bringing you the programming PMP is known for. Tonight, you can ask the author a question by clicking on the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. You can also read other people's questions and even vote for the ones you'd like to hear answered the most. Finally, we want to thank you for being here with us tonight. We are so thankful um, to our family of loyal customers, keeping our business and our spirits afloat. Tonight, we are thrilled to welcome Jennifer Weiner, New York Times best-selling author of In Her Shoes and Mrs. Everything. Her newest novel, Big Summer, is a witty, moving story about family, friendship, and figuring out what matters most. Tonight, Jennifer Weiner will be in conversation with Ashley Spivey, a social media activist, part-time podcast host, and host of Spivey's Book Club. As you may have seen on our social media and on their social media, um, they both shared their summer, their favorite summer drinks. Um, there is a poll down below where you can tell us which is your drink of choice tonight. Now it is my pleasure to welcome Jennifer Weiner and Ashley Spivey to PMP Live. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello, Ashley. <laughs> We're it's wearing so our sun hats. Oh, I know. I feel so beachy. Wearing our sun hats and dreaming of the beach. <laughs> Fake it till you feel it, right? <laughs> I'm sorry? Fake it till you feel it, right? Exactly. Exactly. Like, I'm in Philadelphia. I think it's like 40 degrees outside. All of my plants are like dead. <laughs> It's feeling like very biblical, you know, I'm just, I'm waiting for locusts. I think the locusts are next. The murder hornets. <laughs> yes, the murder hornets, right? It's, yes. I don't know, man. It's it's not good. Well, I'm here in New York and I, I tried to bring my plants all into view so it would look like it feels sort of warm in here. I don't know. And <laughs> keeping the theme alive, I have my gator pain. I don't know if everyone else has a drink. Tell us in the chat if you do. Jen, what are you drinking tonight? Okay, so the drink that I wanted to have was the drink that is mentioned in the book. It's the, the signature cocktail that Drew serves at her rehearsal dinner, which is a delicious mixture of apricot nectar and champagne with a squeeze of lime. But wow. I can't find I can't find apricot nectar anywhere. Nobody will give it to me, so I just have iced coffee. I'm and it's mostly milk, so <laughs> I'm sad. But I'm holding it down for the non-drinkers. Close enough. <laughs> and there's a poll down below where y'all can vote for your favorite drink tonight. Um, you can also ask us some questions. But the most important button that you will find below our beautiful faces is the buy button, which if you don't have the book by now, you have to order it ASAP. Um, it's one of my favorite books that I've read lately. I just have to say like, it's hard to do a spoiler free chat for this book, but we're gonna do it. <laughs> we're not gonna reveal too much about it. Um, and I think that's very important for everyone who purchases a book to realize that this book is gonna surprise you. <laughs> I hope. Yes, um, in a good way, not in a bad way, in a good not way. Not a bad way. No, not at all. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if you remember this, but you and I talked, I think it was in 2013, because you asked me for some behind the scenes info about The Bachelor. Uh-huh. So I was like your- You were my source, that that's right. I was right, I did a, I I did a piece for Allure and you, you like told, it was great. <laughs> so I think team. this is such, yeah, exactly. And that's such a crazy, like full circle turn of events because now we're talking about one of your books that has a bacheloresque theme to it. Yes, it so, does. <laughs> I mean, it's 
it's a, a small part of the book. Um, but I just, I, I thought that was so crazy. It, it's a small part of the book, but it's sort of symbolically important because the heroine of this book is an internet influencer. And her name is Daphne. She's a young woman in her 20s. She lives in New York City. She's just starting to figure out her life and taking baby steps on the internet to sort of um, start using her platforms to build her brand and make some money. And a lot of the book has to do with like public and private and who you really are versus who you are pretending to be like the life that you're performing, whether you're performing it on your Facebook or on your Instagram or on a national dating show. Because as we learn, the contestant in the show, which I have called all the single ladies, not the bachelor, not the bachelorette, it's all the single ladies. Um, but we meet one of the women on the show who was sort of the nice, sweet, good girl who everyone was rooting for, the one who got the Disney princess edit. And it turns out IRL, she's something very, very different than that. Yes. Um, was there anyone who kind of inspired that character? I mean, <laughs> you don't watch um, the anymore, right? I, I, I stopped. I had to stop after Trump. I feel like what happened was I was I, I watched The Bachelor and then I watched um, you know, the, the, the bachelor paradise Island or where, what is it called? Where they, you know, they send them all to the Island and they date and they hook up. Bachelor right. in paradise. Yeah. Bachelor in paradise. Okay. So I watched that and then it ended and, and Chad was like the villain of that cycle, like the scary stalker guy who like everybody hated. And after the show ended, I started watching the Republican primaries and the Republican debates. And I was like, Trump became in my head like he was the season's villain and I kept hoping that he didn't get like voted off the island because I'm like well he keeps it interesting you know he's the most interesting one of them to watch because God knows what he's gonna say you know so I I sort of feel and I hope I'm not like offending anybody politically but I, I feel like personally I kind of reality tv showed my way into being the tiniest bit responsible for where we are now. And I just feel so bad about it. But, um, okay, so remember Emily though? Emily, the single mom who like came on the show and it, her her husband had, had there was the race car driver and he died and she yeah. was like, I, I she literally got an edit where I was surprised they weren't like Photoshopping in Cinderella's birds to help her get dressed, you know? <laughs> Like no, she, she was, she was, she was <laughs> right? yes. so like, she was that girl. And, and yes. in real life, I mean, who knows, like people generally, you know, not all good or all bad, but you know, it's, it, it all happens as you know, in the editing room, like they decide, okay, what are our stories going to be? Who's our villain? Who's our hero? And they craft, you know, they craft the, the show around that. So I right. was very, very interested in, in that aspect of things, in the aspect of like, who are you really versus what can you do with that raw material when you get on social media? And I think that's such an interesting concept to explore because when these, when people go on the show, you can see their life before if you look mm -hmm. at their Instagrams. Um, and it's just amazing how it is after they are on the show, how their friends change, um, who's appearing in their pictures with them, what mm -hmm. they post about. All that just really seems to change once they find fame and once they're scared to post about certain things, whether they think, you know, people will stop following them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. Yes, yeah. somebody who is like very, very marginally famous. Like I joke that I'm writer famous, which is like not famous. It's like being like a famous sculptor. Like I don't get recognized in the grocery store. I don't get like stopped on the street. But, you know, I have enough followers that I feel like I have to be careful about stuff. Like I don't want to alienate people. I don't want to upset anybody. So, you know, it's like I have... 
I have text groups and I have chats with my friends where like, that's like the real, real. And then like, I try to be like very authentic on social, but I'm authentic within boundaries. You know, it's like, there's places I don't go. There's I don't talk about, there's things that are completely off limits. And, and I think that's true for most people. I think everyone to some extent is crafting an identity using whatever platforms they're on. And I feel like everybody's on platforms, you know, these days, except like the one guy in my book who wasn't on anything, who was fun to write. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's completely true. And I even tell people, I think that everyone has a different personality on each platform. Mm. Like there are things people will say do on Twitter that they would never do on Instagram. Exactly, exactly. Like, do you remember that meme that went around the Dolly Parton meme where it was like, okay, yes. here I am on Tinder and here I am on Facebook and here I am on LinkedIn and here I am on whatever. You're absolutely right. It's like, you know, people know who's watching them on every platform. They know who they're interacting with. And I think that they craft the content accordingly. And, you know, the trouble, happens I, I well I don't know I mean it's just it's a lot to think about and like as the mom of daughters I have a teenager and a tween a 12 year old I think about this all the time because like I am old enough I'm a Gen Xer and I can remember life before the internet like I was a teenager where you could do something really stupid at a party and people would take pictures and then, you know, the pictures would just exist for the people who'd seen them and the stupid at the party would only exist for the people who saw. But I, you know, with my daughters, I feel like every single thing they do that ends up on the internet is forever. It is there forever. And how do you navigate that when you're still like figuring out like who you are and, and how to make responsible choices? Like I feel so bad for them because I think it's so much harder than it was for me. Do you, are they on Instagram and TikTok and? Yeah. Okay. So my, my older one, like she's on the gram and she has like the Finsta, which is the, the friends that I'm not supposed to know about account and like the Rinsta, which is some other thing that I'm not supposed to know about. And occasionally like, I will be like, okay, let me see your phone and I'll look at what she's posting and I'll look at who she's interacting with. She, I, I kind of dodged a bullet with my older one because she just did not want to be on social for a long time. Like her friends were getting on Snapchat and her friends were starting to do stuff. She's like, nah, nah, I don't care. My little one is obsessed with TikTok. And especially <laughs> since we've been in lockdown, she is on that app. Like we had to like set like a limit on her phone where it like just turns her off. It turns off her TikTok and she gets, I could hear her scream. Like I know when it happens. <laughs> happens because I hear the ah I was in the middle of something but she is um she's a manga fan like the Japanese like cartoons and she likes to do cosplay where she dresses up like like people on the shows and like finds other kids who are fans of the shows and like interacts with them and I mean it's like on the one hand she's met kids who are into what she's into she's made friends she has a community and she has support but on the other hand, it's like, well, do you, you know, are you positive that that kid is, you know, a 13 year old? Like, how do you know? How do you ever know? And all of her accounts are private, you know, and she's always like, can I please make it public so people can see what I'm doing? Cause I'm really proud of it. And I'm like, I understand that you're really proud of it, but I also understand that you're 12. So no, you know, <laughs> like we're locking, we're locking this shit down. But I mean, I, you know, just like they're the first generation of kids growing up with the internet, we're the first generation of parents trying to figure out like, where are the lines and where are the boundaries and how old should they be? And what should we be telling them? And how much should we be checking on them? And like, how do we keep them safe? And how do we keep them sane? And how do we keep our daughters from, you know, comparing themselves to to beauty bloggers or you know people who are doing unhealthy things like 
you know, there's still like pro anorexia communities like that show up on TikTok and, you know, the people running them, like as soon as they find them, they like delete them and root them out, but they keep popping up. And like those, those images are still there. And I don't know. I mean, it is, it is hard. It's always, I think, been hard to like be a young woman, but I feel like this generation is facing unprecedented challenges. I completely agree. Um, I mean, even in terms of how it's affected, I, I don't know, even older people, just in terms yeah. of, I think it gives people unrealistic beauty standards. I think it makes people feel badly about themselves all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just how many people like have, have to take social media breaks because it's just, detrimental to their mental health and it's yes I don't, it's serving i can't i can't even imagine raising two girls right now like I'm so yeah sure. it's um, it's a lot it is yeah. but that kind of brings me to uh the first thing i wanted to talk to you about is uh the protagonist daphne i feel mm -hmm. like that's the protagonist that we don't get to see a lot um and i was wondering if there was any um influencer that you kind of studied or um, talked to about this role that really kind of helped influence who Daphne was? Yes, there there was. Um, I, I don't want to name her, but I found, oh. so Daphne, like I said, is she's a plus size Instagram influencer who's just like getting started. And I found somebody whose profile matches Daphne's a lot. Like she has like 30,000 followers, like, which isn't huge, but isn't nothing. And I got her to like, take me through like step by step by step, how she became an influencer, how she does her job, how much or really how little money she makes doing it. Um, and just the, the whole way that that world is structured where there are a handful of people at the tippy tippy top of the pyramid, you know, the, the Kardashians of the world who are making a fortune, like an absolute fortune. And then there's like this vast, like middle ground of people who are working extremely hard for pennies, basically. And they all have, it was, a, the, the woman was telling me, they all have like the Instagram boyfriend, who's the guy who takes all their shots. And this woman was describing to me, she's like, her boyfriend wanted to take her on a picnic. So they go to this like beautiful park that she knows is going to be like the perfect backdrop for this outfit that she's trying to promote. So, you know, she shows up with like her picnic basket and her bottle of wine and eight outfits in a garment bag. And instead of having this romantic picnic with her boyfriend, she spent the afternoon running in and out of the porta potty, changing into one outfit after another and trying to get shots like in front of like the textured brick wall that they all want pictures in front of. And it was so crazy. It just, it sounded so hard. And, you know, but I think that like the dream is like you blow up and then you, you get lots and lots of followers and then brands want to work with you and then you're on easy street, but it's, it's a long climb to get there. Would you say that it gave you like a newfound respect for it people? It did. It totally, okay. I was such a dummy. I'm like, okay, so, so you wear a dress and they pay you. And she's like, oh no, oh no, no, no. Like she explained to me that like, okay, so say that you're going to work with anthropology like they will send you a code to like pick out something from their new line, which is like the 10 things that they're selling in the store new that week. And you have to pick one thing from there and then you have to style it and you have to make it look great, but you can't make anything else you're wearing look great. Like they have to want to buy the dress and not the necklace, not the hat, not the earrings, not the shoes, not the bag, nothing but the dress. So you got to figure all that out then you got to get somebody to take your picture. Then you got to like figure out which picture you're going to use. You got to edit it, filter it, crop it, you know, futz with it, snap seed it, <laughs> facetune it, get it all perfect. 
And, you know, and then you put it up and then, you know, your followers use a code. So if they then go to anthropology from your website, they enter a code and you get like a dime for every dress that is sold. Like it is work. These women are like, I couldn't do it. I know I couldn't do it. Like, I can't imagine having to like make somebody want to buy something. <laughs> I, like, it's good. You'll like it. And that wouldn't work. <laughs> wouldn't work. Wouldn't work. But I mean, I think that, I mean, you, you don't, you have a following too. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But yes, yours is centered a different aspect of mm -hmm. Instagram. Like, I feel very thankful that people like give a shit about like what I want to talk about because I don't, yes. I don't really post that pictures <laughs> or things like that. I could, I would never be that type of influencer. That's why like, I'm never going to make a lot of money from it. Like I'm fine just getting free books. <laughs> but you, but you know though, that there are women who've like gone on the bachelor or gone on other reality shows. And then it's just like diet teas, waist trainers, makeup lines, hair extension, like, and, and I wonder, you know, was, I, I think in many cases, like The Bachelor or shows like it are a means to an end where it's not like I'm going to fall in love and meet a great guy. It's more like I'm going to get 10,000 followers on Instagram so I can charge brands $100,000, you know, for a year long collaboration or whatever. Like it's, you know, it's sort of it makes me wonder sometimes like about the tail wagging the dog. Like when I, when I see stuff in public and, and then of course another like real life influencer story that made it into this book. Some of you guys will remember this. There was a couple that got engaged and they were both like big deal fashion influencers. Like they each had like a hundred thousand followers and the deal was the guy was like, I'm surprising so-and-so with an engagement scavenger hunt. It's going to take us all over the world. And it ends up in Paris. And he proposes by the Eiffel Tower. And it's all spontaneous and wonderful and romantic. And then it turned out the whole thing was paid for. It turned out that they'd like written up like a proposal. And they'd gone to the airlines and they'd gone to the restaurants and they'd gone to the hotels and they to everybody, you know, do you want to get in on this basically? And, and so it, it, it really, again, to get back to that theme of like authenticity versus the truth, like they really did get engaged. It really was a scavenger hunt, but there was this whole sponsorship element that the, audience wasn't supposed to see you know it was it was spawn con and we weren't supposed to know that i always just wondered like do you just completely lose spontaneity in your life like <laughs> that type of right thing. i i <laughs> just or or i mean and i can feel myself do this sometimes where it's like i'll bake something and my kids will want to eat it and i'll be like wait i need to take a picture first i might want to post that <laughs> and it's like who am I, right? Like, who the hell cares what my banana bread looks like? Uh, although, like, right now, many people do because, like, we're all stuck inside and everybody wants to know everything. But it's it's really, it's messed with the way that we live. And some of it's been good. I mean, it's it's nice that, like, your grandmother on the other side of the country can see video of your ultrasound or your baby taking your its first steps. But... On the other hand, it's like every moment is documented and every picture is filtered, cropped. Um, you know, we it's like we see these perfected images and then we look at ourselves or like our own loaf of banana bread. And it's like, well, what the hell happened here? What went wrong? Why am I not that? You know? Right. So... In terms of, um, you know, this whole isolation and quarantine and social distancing, um, you also had to deal with your publication date being moved up. Yes. Um, can you talk a little about why that happened? Like, are you are you happy that it yes. got moved up? Um, yeah, I I was actually the one who was lobbying for that because, okay. like, we so I I went to New York. 
in February and we had like this whole conversation about like, here's what the book tour is going to look like. Here's where you'll go. Here's the bookstores. You'll do this. You'll do that. Fantastic. You know, and then I went home and then the last public facing event I did was March 7th at Politics and Prose. I did an event with Laura Zygman for her book, Separation Anxiety. And a couple of days later, like they, they, um, my, both of my daughter's schools got, you know, not canceled, but transitioning to distance learning. And then we got our safer at home orders. So I had, had to figure out what to do. My, my publisher and I had to figure out what to do. And we looked at, you know, all of the same models that everybody was looking at. And, you know, just the initial publication, the original publication date was May 19th. And it just like May 19th sort of looked like when things were going to be cresting. And I'm like, I don't think I'm going to be going on book tour. Like that's not looking likely. So I, and then we were like, okay, well, do we publish the book in 2001? Or do we publish it later in the summer? Or do we publish it in the fall? And I'm like, I really don't think we can sell a, a book called Big Summer in the fall. It just doesn't feel right. right. And so I said, of all the, I think that Big Summer is one of the, the most fun and fast moving and fast paced and, you know, and it's set at a beach, right? And none of us are going to the beach anytime soon. So if I can give readers a book that makes them feel like just a little bit like they're in Cape Cod, which is one of my favorite places in the world, that is a gift that I can give people right now. And I, I hope that like, I mean, one woman wrote on my Facebook page this morning, she's like, I got my book in the mail today and I'm so happy my mom passed last week of COVID-19 and it's been really hard. And I hope that your book is going to sort of help me escape a little bit. And that's what I want to do because like, there's just so much right now, like whether you're at home with kids going stir crazy, whether you've lost your job as so many people have, or they've been furloughed or they've been laid off. Um, whether there's somebody in your life who's been sick, who's recovering, who's not recovering. Like, I feel like everybody could use a fun book at this moment. And if I can provide them with that fun book, that makes me happy. I think also it's not only like a love story to Cape Cod, but I think it's also a love story to New York. And uh, being in New York right now, seeing it so shut down, um, you, you talk a lot about like the food community, all of the best restaurants in New York. And I thought that was really great to read that right now. It made me, you know, so homesick, even though I'm yeah. in New York, um, just being able to walk around and visit all of our favorite places. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one aspect that I loved of, about it. Not only did oh, I feel like thank I was you. at the beach, but also um, experiencing the best parts of New York. Like even when I was reading it, I was thinking in my head, like, I wish right now that I could go visit all of the places that you were talking about. And then you know how sometimes they do a playlist for a book? Mm -hmm. I think you should do like a restaurant list for this one. That would be genius. <laughs> or I should just do like a, a food list, like every yeah, like food, a food tour. that gets named in the book, because there's a lot of them. Yes. Um, I mean, so yeah, it's, I, I, spent a lot of time thinking about like where in New York Daphne lived, where she would walk, what places she'd go to eat, like where her father would take her. Um, in Big Summer, Daphne, the protagonist and her father have this really lovely relationship where every weekend they find a new restaurant to go try, like a new kind of cuisine, like Thai food or Indian food or Himalayan food or Russian food or Polish food, like some kind of thing that they've never tried. And they, they like do some research about the place they're going to be eating the food from and they, they learn a little of language and Daphne has to figure out how to get them there on public transportation. Um, but it was very much like you said, it was a love letter to the vibrancy and the diversity of New York's food scene and how you can just eat. I, there, there's 
I, at some point in the book, the father is talking to Daphne and says, like, do you know how many languages are spoken in New York City? And it's like hundreds, like people speak hundreds of different languages and there's hundreds of different kinds of food. And I loved writing about all of the different things, like the different kinds of dumplings and and bubble tea and like the Japanese toast with the red bean paste. And and then when they get to Cape Cod, like the malasadas and the oysters and all of the delicious stuff that I can't get right now. Um, I mean, I love writing about food. And I, I think that's something that like a lot of the reviewers have noticed. They're like, this book will make you hungry. And I'm like, sorry, I'm sorry. I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, was, is the Sunday supper, is that in, inspired by anything you do with your family or that you did with your parents or did that? Oh my God. Anywhere? I do. Do I, I wish I'd had a father who had taken me out to eat every <laughs> weekend. I mean, that was sort of like, I, I wanted to give Daphne like a very solid home life because she has, as you learn, a very fraught life with her friends at school. She gets kind of bullied. She feels very less than. She ends up as sort of the sidekick of this rich, beautiful girl who doesn't treat her very nicely. And I wanted to give her a father who loved her and who saw her in all of her dimensions and appreciated her and encouraged her and loved her. Um, and, and I think that like, there's, there's different love stories in this book, but I think the relationship between Daphne and her father and the way that he cares for her by showing her the world, by showing her like every delicious thing to eat in New York city. Like I, it was something I imagined. And I think it's, it's something that's probably pretty wonderful to, for a girl to have. So I loved writing all that stuff though. Ah, oh, so nice. Well, that's what I was going to say is I I went into it thinking that this was going to be a story about friendship. Um, but the relationship I think I really just loved the most was the story between Daphne and her dad. Like, I, I yeah, just, right. I, yeah. I love that too. It's like, there's, there's like a friend and there's like a hot guy and there's a horrible grandmother who puts Daphne on a diet when she's old. And let me tell you, if like the food scenes were my, my favorite to write, like the taking the little girl to Weight Watchers was the hardest part. And it just like, I mean, the, the research that I did for that, and some of you all will remember this, but Weight Watchers last year unveiled an app that was for kids like from eight years old to 12 to like help them track their food. And a bunch of experts like spoke up and they're like, this is not going to help kids lose weight. This is going to give them eating disorders. This is going to like make them insane about their bodies. Please don't do this. Please don't put your daughters on diets. And then there was just this outpouring on social media of women that were just telling their diet horror stories of like, I, you know, I had to count calories when I was nine or my mom took me to Weight Watchers and then to like step aerobics when I was 12. And just like all of these women whose relationship with food and with their own bodies and with their sense of who they were was just damaged for forever, for like years and years and years that it's taken them to get over it. So... I had a lot of stories when I went into the Daphne and Nana section. So Daphne's parents are teachers and they have to take summer jobs to like make ends meet so they can live in New York city. So one summer they leave Daphne because she's not young. She's not old enough to go to the camp that they're working at. And they leave her with her grandmother who goes through the house with a trash bag tosses all the white sugar, all the white flour, all of the butter, all of the cheese, all of the anything you'd want to eat. And then says to Daphne, like, we're going to eat healthy this summer and you're going to exercise. And Daphne is like, she's so hungry that she like sneaks into the neighbor's house and like takes their baking chocolate and eats that. And if any of you guys have ever eaten baking chocolate, like, you know, that is desperation because it's terrible. Horrible. Um, Terrible. Yes. But, you know, it was just so 
sad and so like hard to think about just I mean it, it felt almost like writing about child abuse and it was hard it was hard and you know I think it's like it's a, it's a hard it's going to be a hard part of the book for I think some people to get through I had the opposite experience with my grandma. I, Tell me. <laughs> we call her girlfriend. We don't call uh -huh. her grandma. So that should like tell you a little bit about her. Okay. Um, but she would just like make us sit at the table and eat every bit of our food like until we <laughs> threw up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's maybe taking it too far in the other direction. But yeah. I mean, just like having somebody in your life who like, loves you and loves food and wants you to like eat delicious things like I think that leaves you with such a different sense of yourself than somebody who's just like you're you're there's something wrong you don't look right you don't look like you're supposed to you don't look like the other girls you know that's a hard thing and and I I think that it's it's a familiar thing sadly to lots of women yeah, I hope, I mean, I hope people already know not to talk to their kids like that, but I hope that after reading this too, it really makes them reconsider. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or to <laughs> tell about food, like, yeah. Um, do you want to start talking about questions people have asked? Yeah, let's take some okay. questions. Let's see what people want to know. All right. How do you come up with the ideas for your books? That's from me. That is an excellent question. Um, I, I wish that there was like, I, it's different for every book, honestly, like, and I don't know where they come from. Like it's, I feel like they're gifts in a way. And I also, something that another writer said that really resonated with me was like the idea that like, the books are out there already and it's our job as writers to like go find them and almost go in like sculptors and start like chipping away the stuff that's not part of the story until we like get to the story, if that makes any sense at all. So like with, with Mrs. Everything, which was the book that I wrote before Big Summer, like that, that was a version of my own mother's life story. It's not the true life story because my mother won't tell me what that really is. But it's sort of like me trying to imagine like what my mom's life must have been like and what her choices were like and what it was like to, you know, be a woman in the 60s and in the 70s and in the 80s when there were those shoulder pads and, you know, <laughs> all that stuff. So with Big Summer, after I finished Mrs. Everything, which took place over 70 years and had this very intricate timeline and took place in cities I'd never lived in, in eras I'd never lived in. And I had to research the fashion and the music and the cars and the every single little piece of everything. I was so tired and burnt <laughs> out. And I was just like, I am going to write a book that takes place over three days in Cape Cod because <laughs> I know Cape Cod really well. And I wanted to do something that was like taking place over a compressed period of time. And it would be like a romp, you know, like a, a wedding where things go wrong. Like I had that idea. I knew it was going to be long weekend, Cape Cod, wedding, things go wrong. I didn't know, I didn't know exactly what it was going to be. Um, those parts sort of revealed themselves as I wrote. So I guess the answer to the question is the characters come first. Like I'll, I'll have a character in my head. And then I just have to figure out like, okay, what is her journey? Like, who is she at the start of this book? And who do I want her to be at the end of it? And what does it take to get her from A to B? And that's my story. That's, that's my book. There it is. <laughs> I love that. I mean, I loved Mrs. Everything so much. Oh, but I thank can you, Ashley. How that would be just so epic. <laughs> right. Um, so, I mean, I almost feel like not that writing Big Summer is a, a vacation, but I can see like your like mental space in both books. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And like not every book is going to be like the the, you know, the three generation, you know, 70 years epic. Like 
sometimes it's going to be like a little more frothy and a little more fizzy and a little more fun and all those F words. But, you know, it's like, I really did want to just like entertain myself almost like that's another important element of like, where do the books come from? It's I write things that I would like to read and I write about issues that are interesting me at that moment. And so with this book, like, you know, because I have these daughters who are the ages that they are, I think a lot about social media and the internet and influencer culture and public and private and, you know, authenticity versus artifice and how they're going to navigate all of that stuff as they get older. So I, I think all of that was on my mind and it just sort of like, you know, simmered for a while and then it became big summer. I love it. Okay. Sarah Snow, can you talk about your own journey with body positivity? Oh, that is a really good question. Okay. So, um, I, began my writing career. I mean, I'd, I'd always been a reader. I'd been a reader my whole life. I was an English major in college. And then I was a journalist. I was a newspaper reporter for about 10 years. And I was always writing fiction. I would write short stories. I would write long stories. I, I wanted to write a novel and I just wasn't quite there yet. And then I got dumped in this horrible final way. And I was 28 years old and I thought I was going to be alone forever. And I was just so miserable mm -hmm. and pathetic. And like, there wasn't the internet yet. So I couldn't even Google stalk the guy. I had to like go do drive-bys of his house, which would have been pathetic <laughs> even if he didn't live two hours away from me. Like I was a mess. I was a total mess. And I had this idea that like, if I lose weight, he'll want me back. And, you know, I've always been more or less the size I am, which is like a size 16. And he was fine with that. Like he, he had no complaints that I can recall. But in my head, I was like, this is the problem. I am the problem. My body is the problem. And I'm going to fix this shit. Right. And I had also spent like my entire twenties, like on it or another, like I had done Weight Watchers a bunch of times and I had hired a nutritionist and, you know, and I had gotten myself signed up for like a trial medication um, at the University of Pennsylvania. They were running this test on a drug that eventually got pulled off the market because it was causing women to have heart attacks, which is a problem. You know, but it, and I remember one of the women in the study saying, but at least I die thin. Oh my and she wasn't even kidding. She was not kidding. But, you know, I just had this idea that like, this is what's wrong. And if I fix it, he'll love me. And after like all of this, like moping and sorrow, I just, I, I think I just like after 10 years of it, I had had enough. And I just said, I'm done with it. I'm done with trying to change what I look like. And I am going to, instead of focusing my energies on that, I am going to focus my energies on telling a story. And I'm going to tell a story to myself where the girl is a lot like me and the guy is a lot like Satan. And I'm going <laughs> to give my happy ending. And so that was sort of it. And, and I knew I was going to write a plus size heroine who accepted herself because I wasn't quite there yet, but I figured like I could almost like write that truth into existence. And if I, I mean, there's this quote that every writer knows and it's Toni Morrison who said, if the book that you need to read isn't on the shelf, you have to write it. Like that's your job. And I think that like, if I had been a teenager or if I had been a young woman and there'd been a book where a plus size heroine got, she was the star of the show. She was the protagonist of the novel and she got her happy ending and her story did not involve weight loss. Like, I think that that decade of my life would have been much happier. And I think 
that's true for a lot of women who just like the fat girls in books, they were always either like the funny best friend or like the sidekick or the villain, or they would lose a hundred pounds and then they would get the guy and the job and the money and the castle and the whatever. So I was like, I'm going to write the story that I wish had been there for me to read. And that was sort of the start of it. And I definitely like had like ups and downs and I've had like good days and bad days and days where I can like feel pretty good about myself and days where I'm just like, oh my God, if Adele is skinny, why can't I be skinny too? I mean, the Adele thing is just a whole, you know, it's a big deal, but I I'm actually, I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to change locations because my computer is dying. <laughs> Oh my changations. Oh no. <laughs> this is fun. We're traveling okay. through Ashley's. Oh my God. I we is are. that wallpaper? <laughs> is, is that wallpaper? <laughs> that is the best wallpaper. Wow. Okay. I am that is so amazing. sorry. No, 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 don't worry. Please. Okay. That was exciting. <laughs> All right. So, you know, long story short, like, and then I had daughters, and then I was like, I ha I can't like diet or talk crap about myself in front of my kids. Like that, you know, it's, it's one thing to like have these voices in your head or, you know, to like do the thing that Daphne's mother does like in front of the mirror where she's like twisting and turning and like trying to like look at all her angles and obviously isn't happy with any of them. But, you know, it's like I can perform positivity for my children, even if I don't feel it. And I guess that's like one place where the difference between like the truth and the performance is a good thing. Completely agree. Um, let's go to the next question. Would you ever lead NYC or other city food tours? Oh my God. <laughs> yes, I would do that in a minute. I mean, I'm not sure I'm qualified to do New York because I don't live there, but I live in Philadelphia and I could take you to find every delicious thing in Philadelphia Oh my God, that would be like a dream. Would people want to do that? Would people come for that? That would be kind of great. I mean, it's so sad. I was supposed to do a writer's retreat in Cape Cod this year. And of course that got canceled along with everything else, but we were going to have some amazing food. So maybe someday, maybe someday when we can all be together again, I will lead you to the promised land of cannoli and cheesesteak that is Philadelphia. So my husband's a huge Eagles fan. So we're always, uh -huh. and he's wearing like all Eagles, everything right now. <laughs> so I need that list. <laughs> I will give it to you. I will tell you. Okay. I will tell you where to go. Oh, he's showing. Oh, there it Eagles. is. Look at that. Oh, my God. <laughs> I love that. Oh, my okay. God. People are saying they want to take the tour. Wow. Okay. Here comes my second career. Finally. I mean, I feel like you need a big summer tour for whenever everything opens back up in New York, too. I would love to do that. I mean, I would love to take people to the Himalayan Yak. I would love to take them to Sahadi's in Brooklyn. I would love to take them to, like, my favorite Japanese tea house. Um, you know, there's just there's so much out there that's so delicious and I really hope that all my favorite restaurants make it through this. Like, I'm sure you guys have all been reading the same scary stories about like, you know, their business model and like how they're getting gouged by some of these delivery places and what's going to happen. And I, I'm hoping for the best for everything, but I think for restaurants, especially. No, I, we're always kind of like, should we cook or should we be ordering out? So all of our uh -huh. favorite can stay afloat. Right, exactly. I'm like, no, we have to, we have to, you know, order from Sankey because it's a public service, you know? Right. It's like, I can feel like it's philanthropy to like go get pizza. It's great. Um, Someone wants to know, you write so many books. Do you work on multiples at one time or do you write one and then the next? Okay, so I am a one at a time lady. I don't try to do things at once because I'm sure I would fail horribly at it. Um, you know, and and sometimes I will have book like back to back years, but I I don't think that's going to be like 
I, I think that sometimes it's going to be two years between books and sometimes it's going to be like it'll be a children's book or it'll be an essay collection. But I work on one thing at a time and like before all of the all of the Rona, I would work in the afternoons and my office is in my closet because my closet has doors that close, which was really important when my kids were little. I could close the bedroom doors and then the closet doors and then they really couldn't get to mommy. But, um, you know, it, it was also just like, I, I live in this house that has this ridiculous closet. Like it's basically the Carrie Bradshaw in Sex in the City 2 closet that Big gives her. Except I do not have the Sarah, I do not have the Carrie Bradshaw wardrobe or <laughs> shoe collection. So I, I just like I filled it with books and um my child the, the clothing that my children have outgrown. And um it's mostly it's like a library and an off then there's like a vanity where like a fancy person would do her makeup but like that's where I write and I I have I'm pretty disciplined um and I credit my life in newspapers for that because I got very used to like writing every day and just you know being able to like get some words on a page so I'm pretty good about doing that and I'm pretty discipline. I'm extremely, extremely lucky because I love writing. I love telling stories. I love imagining things and, and making things up and thinking about characters and how they sound and how they look and what they do and all of that stuff. And I, I feel incredibly, incredibly lucky that this is my job and this is what, what I get to do in my life. I, I really feel lucky and happy. Now I'm just thinking about your closet. <laughs> it's amazing. It's so nice, but it's it's also like full of laundry that I haven't folded, so I can't I can't show you. <laughs> I'll post some pictures later, maybe. No, please do because I have the tiniest closet ever, so I'm very jealous. All right. Okay. Well, come to Philadelphia, and you can huge closet too. <laughs> Don't tell my husband that. <laughs> All right. I won't. I will not. Um, what advice do you have for aspiring writers? That's a really good question. And the first thing I'll tell you is that if you go to my webforwiner.com, because I'm really creative, I have like 20 pages of advice for writers. It's like my whole story of how I wrote my first book, how I found my agent, how I found a publisher, like the whole shebang is there. But a couple of things that I will say, like the first advice I would give an aspiring writer is like, don't, don't wait for somebody else to give you permission or tell you that you are a writer. Like, I think that women maybe especially like have internalized some insecurity where they're like, well, I didn't study English or I don't have a master's degree or I just don't know if I can really do this. And the only way you're going to find out if you can really do it is like if you sit down and try. So don't wait for somebody to give you permission. Or if you need permission, you have it from me. OK, I have I am telling you here and now that you are a writer and you can go do it and it is OK. Um, and then it's just it's really a matter of putting your butt in the seat and getting some words on, on the page and finding time every day to do that. And I know how hard it is, like, especially for moms, especially for moms of young kids, and especially for moms right now when everybody's kids are home. But if you need to get up early in the morning, or you need to stay up late at night, or if you need to let somebody else clean the kitchen, like make yourself some time and guard it zealously and take it seriously. And I, I think like, if you are going to be a writer, you're going to write, you're going to write no matter, you're going to write if you have a day job, you're going to write if you're, you're a student, you're going to write if you're like on a bus and have some spare time. Like those stories are going to insist that you tell them. So I think it's just a question of like, give yourself permission and give yourself time and take it as seriously as you would any other endeavor. And then go to my website, anything else I wrote. <laughs> That's great advice. Um, can you talk about why summer reading 
or beach reading is sometimes looked down upon. Why shouldn't we be allowed to enjoy what we read? Yes, I can talk about that. I can talk about that all night, probably. <laughs> um, I, I actually for Glamour magazine um, about the term guilty pleasure and whether or not the coronavirus was finally going to eradicate the idea that some pleasures are shameful and some pleasures are acceptable. And because now we're all home and we're all watching like, you know, Love is Blind on Netflix or, you know, the Tiger King or whatever it is we're watching and we're all dance challenges on TikTok and we're all door dashing Donald's. So, I mean, pleasure shouldn't be guilty. Pleasure is pleasure. But I interviewed this woman. She's a PhD. Her name is Sammy Schalk, and she teaches at the University of Wisconsin, like a person of like gender studies. And she talked about like the the pleasures that are called guilty are the ones that are associated with people that we see as sort of lower down on the ladder. So like if if women like soap operas those become trashy, those become guilty pleasures. Or like if poor people enjoy a certain kind of drink or a certain kind of food, that becomes a guilty pleasure too. And she was also saying that like in a capitalist society, like any pleasure is suspicious because we're all supposed to be like good little Puritans who are just working all the time, and don't have vacation fun. So it was very, very interesting to listen to her talk about it. And I, I think that I think that gender has a lot to do with it. I think that things that women specifically enjoy get denigrated in a way that things that men like do not. Um, I don't know why that, well, I don't know why that is. I mean, it's, it's the patriarchy. It's always the patriarchy. But it's, it's just interesting, right? Because like men watch football and men watch professional wrestling and we just kind of let them and women watch Hallmark movies and we like drag them to hell. We read them for filth and like, why? Um, you know, and it's it's interesting too, because like romance, for example, like the, the most scorned, mock, dismissed genre that there is, romance makes more money than any kind of book like makes literary fiction possible in many ways because like a hundred thousand people are going to buy a copy of Nora Roberts latest book and that will make possible the literary novels that are going to sell 500 copies but you know the literary novelists still want to look down their noses at the romance writers and it's it's really kind of shitty because I think that everyone who is a creator is trying as hard as they can to put their best work out into the world. Like certainly I am. Like I want to write the very best books that I, Jennifer Weiner, can. And the best books I can write are going to be different than the best books somebody else can write. But I think that pleasure should be pleasure. I don't think that we should be talking about like that's a guilty pleasure and that's okay. Do you feel the same way about the term chiclet? Yeah, I mean, although I turned 50 uh, in quarantine last month, and Happy it birthday. wasn't even last month, it was March. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I'm old, officially. But like, and at this point, I'd sort of be delighted if anybody called me chick. Like, I was so mad about it for so many years. And now I'm like, please call me chick lit again. Like, I miss <laughs> it. But I mean, no, I mean, it's because, because like, there's no dick lit. Like, right. those books are just books, you know? And like, I I just saw a tweet, like I didn't even read the whole thing, but somebody's just like, we should, we need a term for adult YA. And I'm like, no, we don't. They can just be books too. Like just books. And some of them are for you. And some of them are maybe not for you. And that's okay. Yeah. I don't like when we get too caught up on the terms for what we're reading. Chiclet is one that right, exactly. Chiclet is one I always like try to prohibit people from using in my book club just because I'm like, well, women, <laughs> why, why are you? So yeah, oh, bless you. Bless you. You are doing God's work. Thank you. <laughs> 
Okay, so I think we have um, a few more questions. Um, mm -hmm. Why did so much of this book take place in New York when your books have historically been focused in Philly? That is a really good question too. So I felt like because of the Drew of it all, and I will tell you guys confidentially that Drew is basically Ivanka Trump. Like she is that girl. Um, I her imagine father doesn't that quite my... become right, right. So I it kind of it kind of needed to be New York. Like I love Philadelphia, but I think like if you want larger than life, you have to go to New York City to set your book. And I did want larger than life in this case, so that's why New York and not Philly. Um, I love that it's Ivanka. Like that is exactly who I was picturing when I read it. So right, right, so much better for me. Um, yes. Well, now you all can have that in your head as you read. I wonder if that's going to change people's perception, like when they read it now. I kind of wish I would have known that going into it too. Uh, well. <laughs> Um, do you have any sneak peek info on what you're working on next? Yes, I do. Okay, so what I'm trying to do right this minute is I'm finishing the last book in my Littlest Bigfoot trilogy, which is my middle grade books. So I'm like back in Bigfoot land for the time being. And I, I just have like the very like tiniest seed of an idea for my next adult book, which has to do with like a real life experience that I had where it turns out I am not the only Jennifer Weiner in the world. There are other Jennifer Weiners who like share this crappy name with me. And one of them has an email address that's like one letter away from mine. And I sometimes get her emails. So I see like she's in this like tennis round robin or she's like having a potluck dinner or like whatever. And I feel like I... I know just like the vaguest contours of her life from these emails. And I'm sure she must get some of my emails sometimes because like if people are spelling her name wrong, they're probably spelling my name wrong. And so I, I want to write a book about two women who meet that way, who have the same name and sort of end up in each other's lives because of email. And I know that one of the women is going to be older she's gonna have a teenage daughter her she's go, her best friend has just died um her husband has been laid off like she's not in a great place and the other woman who shares the name is younger and at a very different place in her life and that's literally all i know so far so stay tuned we'll we'll have to see what happens with that because i don't even know right now i love that um when I was on The Bachelor, there was a high school soccer star by the same name of Ashley Spivey. And she, uh -huh. she was on Twitter also. Uh, so uh -huh. people would tweet at her uh, whatever the season Oh, God. Happened, and she ended up blocking me. <laughs> I don't Oh, no. I guess she just like got to me replies. She hated it. So like I always feel bad. That's tragic. <laughs> That's tragic. But like I follow somebody on Twitter who has the same name as like Matt Gates, like the horrible Florida congressman, the guy who like showed up in a gas mask on the House of Representatives floor. And this guy's Twitter handle is like one letter apart from Matt Gates's. And he's like, every time Matt Gates does something stupid, the guy like tweets like, oh God, here it comes. So that happens. It yeah. happens a lot. So, <laughs> Okay. There was one more question. And then I think Jessica uh -huh. is going to come back on um, for a last question that she wants to ask the both of us. But this is something I was also wondering. What are those small books behind you? <laughs> the small books behind me? <laughs> like, what are you guys looking at? Like, the, oh my God, no, they're not small books. It's my chair. Uh -huh. Wait, hang on, hang on. <laughs> They're just, they're they're just books. See, <laughs> it was the chair. All right, but I I have a funny story. 
I have a funny story that I will tell you guys very briefly. There's an account on Twitter called Rate My Zoom Room. And every time somebody goes on TV from their house, the person is like, you know, bad lighting or bad composition or nice angle or whatever. But if people have like, the person running the account calls it the ego wall, where like if they have like their diplomas or like framed pictures of them shaking hands with the president, he's like, uh, you know, five points off for the ego wall. <laughs> And I will tell you that this wall used to have all of my framed book covers on it, but I took them down because I'm so afraid of the Zoom Room account, like getting up in my business. So um, yeah, it's uh, I did some redecorating <laughs> this afternoon. <laughs> I'm so ashamed. But yeah, they're just books. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that cracks me up. Um, I, I want to tell Jane, I see your question, but it's actually um, the last question that we're going to answer. So I promise that it's going to get asked. Um, so I promise we're going to get to it. Now I'm like worried about like the Zoom thing happening to me. <laughs> you're, oh, you're fine. You have nothing to worry about. I was going to I was going to get dragged, though. So I had to I had to change it up back there. <laughs> All right, you guys ready? Yeah. I think. Is Jessica gonna, gonna come back? Is Jessica coming? I don't know. Oh, here we go. There she <laughs> is! Yay! <laughs> um, so before we wrap up tonight, we wanna ask you guys one last question. What are you currently reading or is there anything you'd like to suggest? All right, Ashley, you go first. Oh, okay. okay. I actually have my books uh, with me, the actual covers. Um, so the first one um, is Beat Read by Emily Henry. Um, I, I really love this book. I can't suggest it. Uh, I think that Big Summer and Beach Reads are like the perfect books to read right now to kind of take you out of quarantine time. Um, the next book is Ask for More by Alexandra Carter. And I know the title is kind of misleading. I, it has it has to do with like asking for more at work, but it actually will just help you negotiate better with your partner, with your friends. It will help you negotiate better with people you don't see eye to eye with. Um, it, it will teach you a lot. So I highly recommend that book. Head Over Heels. Um, this is one that I'm really excited for. I have not read it yet. I actually just got it in the mail today. Um, Act Like a Lady by the Lady Gang Girls. I'm very excited for this one too. Have not read it yet, but it's next up on my list. And then The Knockout Queen by Rufy Thorpe. All right. Right. So I got really lucky and I got an early copy of Curtis Sittenfeld's Rodham, which is, I'm sure you guys have heard about it. What would happen if Hillary hadn't married Bill? And it's amazing and it's engrossing and it's a little upsetting because I, I don't want to say anymore, but it's, it's wonderful. And for those of you who've read American Wife by Curtis Sittenfeld, I, I think that Rodham is a wonderful companion piece to that. Okay, so this is out in paperback. This is The Farm by Joanne Ramos, and it is about surrogacy and wealth and money and power and race. And it's about two women, one of whom is a, a Filipina nanny who agrees to rent her body out and gestate a child for a rich, powerful person. And the other protagonist is the woman who runs the agency that has contracted with Jane. It's so good and it's so timely. And the last book is by my friend, Laura Zygmunt. This is Separation Anxiety. This is the book I went to politics and prose to talk about. It's about a woman whose life is falling apart. Her teenage son won't talk to her. Her husband is a stoner whose job is sourcing snacks at work shares. And she starts to um, deal with all of the stress in her life by wearing her little Sheltie in a sling, in a baby sling, which sounds nuts, but it works. 
she's actually coming um, on Spivey's book club to do a takeover, and I'm very excited for that. Oh, it's it's so it's so she's the best. You'll love her. She's great. I can't wait. Thank you both so much for being here tonight, and thank you to everyone who attended this great event. Um, you guys are so amazing. Um, your patron. <laughs> Um, your patient is, is what enables us to bring you programming, programming like these, and we cannot continue to host these types of, event, of events without the book sales to support them. Um, please support tonight's author, um, the one that's Jennifer Weiner, um, and, and politics and prose by buying Greg Summer using the button below, which is right underneath Jennifer. Um, you can also be notified of all of the upcoming events as well by clip by clicking the PNP icon at the top of your screen to see a list of upcoming events um, using the Crowdcast website. Um, stay well read and we'll see you next time. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Ashley, thank you. This was great. I had so much fun. Thank you for letting me. <laughs> this was awesome. All right, good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>